Rushwood Center at Ryerson Woods presents the 37th Annual Smith Nature Symposium. Rushwood Center is located in the Ryerson Woods Forest Preserve in Riverwoods, Illinois, and honors this land as the traditional home of the Council of Three Fires. Today, Brushwood Center continues to be a place where many people from diverse backgrounds find healing, vitality, and relationship with nature. You can learn more and support this work at brushwoodcenter.org. Now is the time to create a more resilient tomorrow. This year, the Smith Nature Symposium Series explores what it will take to build a more just and sustainable future in the aftermath of COVID-19. Welcome to the 37th Annual Smith Nature Symposium. Good evening, I'm Bill Curtis. And I'm Donna La Pietra. We're going to be your hosts for the 37th Annual Smith Nature Symposium. I know, it looks a little different, right? Uh, we're normally supposed to be under a tent in Ryerson Woods. But this year, well, you all need to find your own neck of the woods. And for us, that's our woods right here by our house and right by our tree house behind us. So get comfortable, relax, sit back, wherever your perch is, enjoy a drink perhaps, and uh, we're gonna get things underway. First, Bill, how about a little bit of history? Well, let's do it. The Smith Nature Symposium began in 1984 as a way to memorialize the civic and environmental legacy of Herman Dunlap and Ellen Thorne Smith. The Smiths generously donated their land and cabin to help form Ryerson Woods. They shared their leadership with notable institutions across the Chicago region. And tonight we continue to pay tribute to their incomparable gift and to the land that we all share, the global gift of the natural world. We could not be more fortunate than to have Bill McKibben and Sue Halpern join us as this year's symposium honorees. And we're going to look forward to talking with them, getting their insights. That's coming up a bit later. This evening, we also celebrate the Brushwood Center's impact in our community. We need their work more than ever. With wildfires to the west, hurricanes to our south, and the pandemic raging around the world, it's obvious that business as usual can no longer be tolerated. So what does a nature organization do in the midst of all this? That's easy, Bill. Brushwood Center doubles down. The center's COVID-19 response tackles these pressing needs with the belief that every individual deserves to thrive, not merely survive. Throughout this evening, you can text the word THRIVE to 72572. Can I say that again? Please. Thrive. That's what you text, THRIVE, to 72572. Oh, you can do that anytime to donate to Brushwood Center. And now we welcome the Center's Executive Director, Catherine Game, to tell you about the important COVID-19 initiatives and how you can support them. Thank you, Donna and Bill. Let us take a moment to first recognize the ancestral roots of this land. This year, Brushwood Center adopted a land acknowledgement statement created in partnership with the American Indian Center of Chicago. A land acknowledgement is designed to bring more awareness to the history of Native peoples and their territories. It also challenges us to rethink our relationship with the land, with each other, and how we work together to dismantle the legacies of colonialism. About 200 years ago, this very place was a Potawatomi trading route along the Des Plaines River. This part of Illinois was home to the Ottawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi nations, together known as the Council of Three Fires. 
This area was also home to other tribes, the Ho-Chunk, Miami, Menominee, Meskwaki, and Salk. We honor the multicultural traditions of this land, the history of Native peoples, and those who continue to shape and maintain these traditions. In this spirit, Brushwood Center's mission is to promote the importance of nature for cultivating creativity, inspiring learning, and nurturing personal and community well-being. As we gather this evening, we are so grateful for you. Friends, it has been quite a year, and it's not over yet. But if the last seven months are an indicator of the challenges that lay ahead, I have hope because you, our partners, our volunteers, our supporters, our friends, you have shown up. You have supported our community in countless ways with the belief that nature and the arts are powerful pathways to healing and that everyone deserves to thrive. Tonight, we thank our generous sponsors for supporting this event and supporting Brushwood Center's mission. Our gold sponsor, Adele Simmons, who is the daughter of the namesakes of the symposium, Herman Dunlap and Ellen Thorne Smith. The Smiths, along with the Ryersons and several other families, donated their land and cabin to help form Ryerson Woods. And the symposium memorializes their civic and environmental legacy. We thank Kauai Pianos and Family Piano Company for supporting Brushwood Center's new music and nature program, which launches this evening with our musical tribute, coordinated by Vladimir Kalenovich and performed by him and Philippe Quinn. Our silver sponsors, Lili and Henry Barkhausen, Amy and Robert Heinrich, Melanie and Ed Ranney, Jean Meilinger and John Schneider, and Total Insurance Services, as well as our friend sponsors, our ambassador sponsors. Thanks to our media sponsors, WBEZ and Better, our In Kind sponsors, and our program sponsors throughout the year. A special thanks to our host committee and our board of directors as well. Tonight, we celebrate the strength of community. Bill McKibben and Sue Halpern, our 2020 honorees, embody this in their bold writing and grassroots activism. At Brushwood Center, we know that in the face of the crises before us, our greatest power is community resilience. So let's celebrate our community. We celebrate more than 100 volunteers who continue to help Brushwood Center make and distribute more than 5,000 cloth face masks to high need groups across the Chicago region. We celebrate our artists who, without missing a beat, moved classes online, created virtual exhibitions, and lifted our souls out of the darkest times with the power of beauty and creativity. We celebrate our 25 partners across the Americas who worked with us to give more than 800 families from low-income communities nature explorer backpacks so that they can feel safe and knowledgeable accessing the nature in their own backyard. We celebrate the 1,500 people of all ages who joined us for virtual programs since March, ranging from bird camp to art and nature therapy for teens. We celebrate the military veterans and artists who helped us paint a 40-foot mural at the Lovell Veteran and Military Hospital in North Chicago, creating a healing space for doctors, patients, and staff during this high-stress time. We celebrate these 565 acres of biodiversity, providing sanity and solace to record-setting numbers of hikers and visitors. We celebrate the 34 speakers across the Great Lakes region who presented over the last two months as a part of our Smith Nature Symposium. From young leaders sharing their vision for a just and sustainable future where Black Lives Matter to clean power Lake County and the fight to safely close the Waukegan coal plant. We are inspired and we are ready for action. The following film highlights a few of these stories of community strength from Brushwood Center's COVID-19 response.
the focus on well-being and people and nature is something that has been overlooked in the past. And as a healthcare worker in uh, the healthcare industry, I see the value of nature and the value of people and that connection and well-being. I think the most impactful for me has been able to contribute to the community with the masks. It's not only that we distribute masks, but the fact that Brushwood could call on the community to have them come and make masks and bring that back to the community and distribute. I think that's a great tes testament for the community coming together and sharing and helping. I have many relationships with Brushwood. I honestly come here every single day. I'm the mask picker-upper and taker-homer and washer and packager. So at this moment, I probably have, you know, a couple thousand masks all packed and ready to go. And it's part of my routine and it's really fun. My relationship with Brushwood Center is I help youth and families understand the importance of nature. One of the major ways that I've been involved with Brushwood's COVID relief is that I've been helping with the distribution of the Summer Explorer backpacks. These backpacks included two different census books, as well as an activity booklet and two different activity worksheets and a lot of different arts and crafts materials. All of these things were provided both in English and in Spanish, so the whole entire backpack was completely bilingual. People are actually taking time out to look at the trees and, you know, flowers. Um, it's important. I think people will start to appreciate the beautiful earth that we have and all that it entails. But it starts with like just a nature center, a walk in the park. It helps with your, your peace of mind. A lot of people are struggling mentally with uh, COVID-19. Uh, people are afraid. But I think being involved in nature on a daily or weekly basis, get as much as you can, it helps add value to your life and appreciation of life. Brushwood Center's Addie's Program for Veterans empowers military veteran well-being through the power of art and nature. And so by combining those two modalities, we create a therapeutic environment for veterans who are recovering from the after effects of, of combat or of service. We are right now in the midst of a partnership with Medewin Tallgrass Prairie, and we realized that there was an opportunity to combine virtual programs with on-site ones if the outdoors component was self-guided. So parents are receiving gift bags, um, they are able to loan our cameras if they need access to a camera, and their work will be featured nationally through the USDA Forest Service social media, in a printed calendar, and in an exhibition uh, at the VA on Veterans Day. They're able to enjoy the outdoors and all of the wonderful health benefits that come, in, that come with being in nature while still being safe and socially distanced. I am a photographer. Um, I've been a photographer since I got out of the military, basically, I got my education. Basically, we try to heal uh, veterans with PTSD through uh, the gift of uh, photography. And, and in this case, nature photography. When I joined the military, I didn't join to be of service to others. When I joined the 12-step program, I didn't join to be of service to others. Then you find out it's all about being of service to others. And that's the real reward. I get more reward doing this than I do a lot of jobs. Just seeing the smile, just knowing you touch somebody and, and hopefully they were touched. I feel like Brushwood has done an amazing job just connecting with um, all of their community partners. They haven't only focused on one, they've done a really great job at making sure that they've helped or that at least that they could provide some help to everybody that is involved with them. When you're in it and you get to feel it and express, express it, I don't know, that's, that's pretty much all I need in the day. You know? I think art and nature is extremely important in today's world and that it, there is a real connection for well-being and balance with people. The real reason I come here is because for me, especially if I have my camera, which I always do, I immediately feel peaceful. They have gone over and beyond the call of duty, and I so appreciate and am honored to be a partner of Brushwood.
Your support has helped so many people in our community thrive through the power of nature and the arts. But we need your help to continue this good work. You can make a donation right now by texting THRIVE to 72572 or by visiting brushwoodcenter.org. Now I have the pleasure of introducing our 2020 Environmental Youth Leadership Award. Made possible thanks to the Brushwood Center Board of Directors, this year's award is in memory of John Simmons, Adele Simmons' husband. John believed passionately in supporting young people through education. And this year's award is a scholarship in the amount of $2,000 presented to Elijah Washington. Elijah was nominated by Brushwood Center's fellow collaborator, Cool Learning Experience. At just 12 years old, he actually presented at our first Smith Nature Symposium Roundtable, our Future Speaks, in August. Elijah's nature name is Northern Shrike, and he is a creative and passionate young leader. Elijah plans to major in modern arts in college, and then study with Alvin Ailey's dance company. Perhaps even more impressive, he wants to come back to his community and give back to those who invested in him. Please join me in welcoming Elijah Washington. Good evening. Thank you, Brushwood Center, for selecting me for this scholarship. My nature name is Elijah Northern Shrike Washington, and I am in the seventh grade. I stand up for what is right, environment, Black Lives Matter, LGBTQ, peace, and many other things. I am creative. I love to dance, write poetry, explore nature, and observe plants as they grow. I love my mom. She's always pushing me to do my best. I've been a student at the Cool Learning Experience program for over four years. This program and the instructors have brought the world to me. They have taught me how to enjoy nature, to explore the beauty hidden in my own backyard, and to explore the places like Brushwood Center. I have learned that I can change the world by appreciating that all I've been given and that I can use my voice. My belief is dream big or go home. I have big goals for the future ahead. After high school, I plan to attend college and study performing arts and modern dance. One day, I will own my own studio and offer free dance classes to individuals without access. I want to fuse environment, meditation, poetry into dance because like Brushwood Center, I know that nature and the arts make people healthy. I will teach my students how to blossom right where they are. And my plans for this award is not to waste. I will set up my school space at home. I will buy my own desk, a computer, and a printer. I would like to buy my mom a gift, but she will not accept it. I will make a donation to the school learning experience and my church. So that's the least I can do for these programs that have given me so much. And I would like to save the rest for my future. Thank you again for this opportunity, and thank you for caring about our planet and future. Thank you. Congratulations, Elijah. Wow, such an impressive young leader. Thank you for sharing your inspirational words with us. Good evening. My name is Gail Sturm, and I serve as chairman of the board of Brushwood Center at Ryerson Woods. I am so pleased to introduce our honorees this evening. The Smith Nature Symposium Distinguished Leadership Award honors notable individuals' work in the world of nature. This award has recognized luminaries near and far, beginning with Roger Troy Peterson in 1984. I would like to take a moment to showcase our past honorees as shown on the screen. Each of these individuals has made a significant contribution to our communities, region, and our nation at large. We thank them for their exceptional and tireless leadership. This year, we could not be more thrilled than to honor Sue Halperin and Bill McKibben with the Distinguished Environmental Leadership Award. As individuals and a couple, you, Sue and Bill, represent the passion, intellect, and teamwork that we all need to overcome today's challenges. In a year where free press, science, climate, and our own democracy are under attack, 
you remain steadfast voices of truth and take action. Sue, your writing for The New Yorker and beyond speaks to the most crucial action we all can take this year for the health of our planet, voting. You are a champion for both nature and democracy. Sue has been a columnist for Mother Jones, Ms., and the Smithsonian Magazine, and has written on topics of science, technology, and politics for Time Magazine, Rolling Stone, and The New Republic, as well as for the New York Review of Books. She is a scholar in residence at Middlebury College, where she directs the program in narrative journalism. She has been the recipient of the Guggenheim and Echoing Green Fellowships and earned a doctorate in political theory from Oxford University, where she was a Rhodes Scholar. Bill, your lifelong commitment to climate change and the environment has opened doors to literally millions of young people now engaged in the global climate movement. Bill is the founder of 350.org, the first planet-wide grassroots climate change initiative, which has organized 20,000 rallies around the world in every country except North Korea. He has inspired countless leaders, including our executive director, Catherine Game, who heard Bill speak in college and joined the global call for higher education to divest from fossil fuels. Bill is the recipient of the Right Livelihood Award, the Gandhi Prize, Thomas Merton Prize, and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has honorary degrees from 18 colleges and universities. Bill's 1989 book, The End of Nature, is regarded the first book about climate change for a general audience and has been translated into 24 languages. He's gone on to write a dozen more books. The Boston Globe said he was probably America's most important environmentalist. It is with deep humility and tremendous gratitude that we present the Smith Nature Symposium Leadership Award to Sue Halperin and Bill McKibben. Please accept this award created by He Young Kim, internationally renowned botanical artist and founder of the Botanical Art Academy at Brushwood Center. He Young is a talented teacher whose work resides in the collection of the Prince of Wales, among many notable others. At this time, I welcome Sue and Bill to join Bill Curtis and Donna LaPietra for conversation on our virtual stage. Well, thank you, Gail and uh, Bill and Sue. It's so wonderful to have you with us. I just want you to know that Bill and I have just a few questions for you. Uh, after all the books that you both have written, I'm sure that we could be with you for hours, but we're going to make this about a half hour conversation. Uh, before we get started, I think we can all see, Bill, that you are in an immobilizer. Can you explain? I'm, I am. Yeah, my right arm is in a sling because there I was on my low carbon bicycle one minute, and the next minute I was flat on the pavement with a lot of broken ribs and a messed up shoulder. So, all I can tell anybody is wear your helmet, wear your mask, wear your helmet. Well, there's some good advice to start off. That's well, for we sure. should know it, you know, a little bit. Uh, Absolutely. Well, Bill, why don't you get us started on the uh, questions? We are uh, two big fans sitting here. We look forward to our discussion, Bill and Sue. You know, journalism and the environment and democracy are under fire these days, we're sorry to say. So why don't we open um, with something of an opening statement from both of you, um, as long as you want or short. Um, uh, Bill, uh, you know, we're looking to you for perhaps a status report on where we stand right now with global warming. And Sue, looking to you for perhaps where, where do you stand on, on the fairness in voting that is coming up? Any, uh, any fears that, of uh, what might happen? <laughs> Sue's, Sue's, Sue's topic may be more time critical, so I'll defer to her first. <laughs> 
Okay. Um, well, I think we all know that we have a problem that democracy is under attack, um, both domestically and from foreign um, agents who are very eager to see this uh, American experiment uh, fail. And um, we've seen that there are numerous voter suppression activities going on, efforts um, by the Republican Party to make it very difficult for people to vote. And that's all of us. Um, last time around, they were primarily interested in having, uh, not, uh, not having um, African-American voters in battleground states voting. Um, this time, they've basically just decided that, you know, we're all game and they don't want to have the um, political will expressed the way it is actually being uh, felt by most people. So I think, you know, one of the things that that's going on is that they're making, you know, voting by mail difficult, they're making voting in person difficult, they're taking away um, drop boxes. And the best thing that I can say is that everyone needs to vote, um, ideally in person, you've got to be prepared to wait because that's happening too. Um, everybody needs to be um, prepared uh, and by which I mean to be safe um, and then just go do it. And um, that's- our, our ballots arrived today in the mail. So we're uh, looking forward to spending the afternoon voting. Yeah, um, we live in Vermont, so um, we're not too concerned about uh, what's going to happen to our ballots, but I think people in states like yours really do need to be uh, concerned and um, need to have a voting plan and need to execute it. And all we can do is hope for the best. So look, um, the climate crisis is something we've known about for three decades, but it does feel like it's only in the last year or two that we, in this country that we've managed to get a kind of critical mass of people paying attention. That's the good news. I mean, the polling shows that upwards of 70% of Americans are now taking it seriously. Among Democrats, it's the number one voting issue going into this election. Uh, the bad news is that because we waited so long, um, things are uh, to one degree or another out of control. Uh, as we're uh, talking today, California passed 4 million acres burned this year. Five of the 10 largest forest fires in California history are currently burning. Um, you know, we're well into the Greek alphabet on hurricanes because we ran out of uh, names in the normal flow of things. Um, um, and so we're not going to get out of this um, without enormous damage. We've raised the temperature of the planet one degree already Celsius. We're well on our way to two degrees and we're headed on current business as usual paths for three or four degrees Celsius. If that happens, we can't have civilizations like the ones we're used to. And so our job is to arrest uh, the, the rise in our temperature as quickly and decisively as we can so that uh, our kids won't have a completely impossible situation to deal with, merely merely a, a, a difficult slash miserable one. So vote. <laughs> vote. Um, I, this really does tie to climate change as well. We've, we've watched our country, we've watched the world uh, shaken by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And at the same time, this summer, we've witnessed civil unrest, the likes of which we actually haven't seen for a while, fed by both racial and social inequalities. Um, are there lessons um, that should be drawn from these two jarring forces that would carry us in a response to climate change? Does the pandemic, in point of fact, relate to climate change? And to what extent the inequalities that we see in the world are affected by climate change? It's a very good question, and I think it relates in profound ways, and I'll just list a few. The first is that physical reality indeed is real. Uh, doesn't matter if the president says that it's a hoax or it's going to go away by Easter or whatever, because he's not actually in charge. The biology is in charge, just in the same way that chemistry and physics are in charge of climate change. So if the microbe says wear a mask, wear a mask. 
Second thing corollary to that is that speed sometimes really matters. You know, the US and South Korea got their first COVID case on the same day in January and the South Koreans went to work. We ignored it. We now know from Bob Woodward that, that we ignored it even though we knew precisely what was going on. Um, and ignoring it turned out to be a poor strategy. That's why we have 200,000 dead people. Uh, and, and for climate change, you know, read the last 30 years for February and March. Uh, you know, we had strong warnings from scientists that we paid no attention to. That means that we now have to move very fast and condense the work of four decades into one decade. And it won't be easy, but we, it just emphasizes the need for speed. But the third thing I think that's most important that we learn is that social solidarity really matters. You know, we came of age politically in the shadow of the Reagan years and the argument that markets were going to solve all problems and that government was the problem, not the solution. Reagan's favorite laugh line was always uh, uh, the nine scariest words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Ha, ha, ha. It turns out the scariest words in the English language are either we've run out of ventilators or the hillside behind your house caught on fire. You can't solve those problems save with people working together, which is what we call governments. And that was really driven home this year because all of this coincided, as you point out, with this racial reckoning that's underway. The most important quote from 2020 is doubtless what George Floyd said is he was being murdered. I, I can't breathe. People can't breathe because they've got a racist cop kneeling on their neck. They can't breathe because police brutality stifles their community. They can't breathe because COVID has filled their lungs with fluid. And we know that uh, COVID follows the same race and class lines as every other sad thing in this country. People can't breathe because there's a coal fired power plant down the street and you know down whose street, uh, you know, asthma rates for African-Americans in this country are three times what they are for white people. People can't breathe because the wildfire smoke is so bad that the authorities have told them to go into their rooms and tape the windows shut. They can't breathe because it's just too damn hot. We saw the hottest temperature ever reliably recorded on planet Earth this summer, 130 degrees in California. Uh, uh, that presaged this spate of forest fires. All of this is to say that we have to finally start working together, together in really deep, powerful ways if we're to have any hope of surmounting any of these problems. And as we start working together, we need to prioritize the most vulnerable people in our communities because they're most vulnerable to every damn thing that happens. Sue, um, if, if and the both of you, uh, have engaged in civil disobedience. Uh, you have organized uh, marches. You've participated in them. I know, Bill, you've been arrested. I don't know, Sue, if you have been. Um, but Don't worry that. How much? Don't worry. She was arrested but it, much earlier than you. Yeah, I think it was a demonstration at the Pentagon or something. But <laughs> what, do you feel that civil disobedience in our current age in particular, does it have a place? Does it work? Does it have an impact? Well, I'm gonna to defer to Bill because he, he actually wrote a piece at one point um, that said that civil disobedience was one of the great inventions and tools of the 20th century. Um, and so I'm gonna to defer to him, uh, Mr. Uh, civil Disobedience. Well, I mean, uh, nonviolent direct action is one tool in the activist toolbox. You don't want to overuse it. Like any tool, it can get dull, literally and figuratively. But there are moments, and you know, um, um, Sue's right. I think uh, if you if you ask me to name the two great inventions of the 20th century that might get us through the 21st, one is the solar panel, which is our biggest hope for trying to cool down the planet. And the other is nonviolent movement building, you know? The suffragists and Gandhi and Dr. King left us a profound legacy and the millions of people who worked with them. Um, and, and we may need that legacy, we probably do, 
in order, among other things, to spread solar panels as fast as we can. Uh, Nonviolence is, is, is the way that the small and the many can stand up effectively to the mighty and the few. And I mean, that's the position we're in right now. Sue, is that why he won the Gandhi Award? <laughs> I, I think so. I hope so. Um, I, I would just add that um, one of the things that we saw in some of the demonstrations this summer um, was some very effective civil disobedience. There was a great uh, video of a march. I think it was in um, D.C. And, and basically everyone just sat down in the street um, and they didn't, they sang and they chanted and they didn't provoke anybody. And it was very moving. Um, and I think it's the way that we overcome some of these narratives about uh, Antifa and, you know, these, these narratives about how all the people who are protesting are violent. I think that's untrue. And if we make it clear that it's untrue, um, it exposes those as, as, as lies. It's also worth noting that we had this amazing round of protest in the last four or five months, and that the people who engaged in it were incredibly responsible in that, as far as we can tell, they were wearing masks and most of the time and did not become the source of spread of, of coronavirus infection. Uh, it turns out that the really dangerous stuff is when you have a party at the White House. Yeah, that's right. yeah, never go to a garden party at the White House. I think which, which suddenly looms as an example uh, of how masks work, in addition to how they don't work. Funny about that. Yeah, we didn't know that before that, so that's good that they pointed that out. Science, science denial is a is a real thing, you know. And people who don't quite believe scientists, medical doctors, climate scientists, whoever, uh, uh, I mean. It, it may be effective rhetorically, but it's not effective physically. <laughs> um, the microbe doesn't care. It may be early to make this observation, but um, wearing masks, I believe, is a good example of not civil disobedience, but civil obedience and how people can work together. We drive into Chicago, into the suburbs, and I have kind of measured uh, weekend after weekend, and it has grown to the point where it's almost 100% in many of the stores we see, the grocery stores. It is effective. Now, if we can... Where we live, yes. Where we live, but if we can simply change, <laughs> wear a mask uh, instead of the coronavirus, wear a mask to reduce the carbon that you use, or well, it doesn't have to be a mask, but follow these steps all together but there's where the leadership comes in and has to declare the Manhattan Project. Of course, part of the problem here is that, you know, thank God with coronavirus, there's nobody whose uh, business plan depends on us all dying of it. Um, and in the case of climate change, some of the richest corporations in the world, their business plan really depends on continuing business pretty much as usual. And that's why it's been such a hard slog. But I think that we're beginning to reach the point, A, where people are realizing that uh, uh, irresponsibility for what it is, and B, where sun and wind now have gotten so cheap and the, the companies that are building solar panels and wind turbines are, are, are beginning to approach in size the, the behemoths of big oil. In fact, last week, uh, New Era Energy, Next Era Energy, the biggest solar and wind company, past Exxon, until recently the richest company on earth in its market capitalization. So things should be beginning to shift a little bit. Remember also that this notion of fake news is a uh, strategy on the part of the people who don't want you to know what's going on. Um, and so they try to make it very difficult to trust um, what you're hearing, what you're seeing. We, you know, go back and read 1984. Um, go back and read Hannah Arendt about, um, about authoritarianism. I mean, this, this is a strategy um, and it's working. Um, but at the same time, we've got a lot of reporters out there, you know, doing really, really good work. And it's really important to recognize that 
um, and to, you know, give them a break when they make a mistake and um, support them. Yeah. Well, and we thank you for the writing that you do. New Yorker is one of my favorite, uh, as well as The Atlantic. And um, um, there's just no question that uh, we believe, uh, for me, for so long, um, too, the idea, I think you were saying, Bill, that, you know, you, you have somebody who says one thing, then you have to counterbalance it with somebody who says the other thing, as if that's the, the truth. And I think the really good journalism that's being done does some of that work of of taking both of those and coming to a point where they communicate something. It's not, oh, this person, oh, then I have to rush over and get that. That somehow is fair and balanced. That's not fair and balanced. That's just presenting opposite sides, but not really shedding any real truth or light. Yeah. It's a, it's a difficult place to be. I think it's a really hard time right now to be an editor, um, to have the kinds of forces pushing on you. Um, you know, when you constantly have people saying, you know, you're, you're part of the liberal media, you're, you know, you're not letting both sides have their say, I think um, it makes it very challenging. Um, it, it's also really difficult when you have a president who lies um, constantly um, and, and you're trying to appear at least to be restrained and, and, and not calling out you know, the truth as, as you hear it. So to that extent, um, I, I think if we ha have any problem with the fake news, it's that the news is sometimes more restrained than it, than it needs to be. Exactly. Let me make a, just a point before we move on. The, we're half hour from Kenosha. Kenosha, who would believe that Kenosha would become the, the belly button for for the United States, and suddenly everybody knows Kenosha, a 17-year-old killed too, uh, as a member of the militia who came in to protect the community from a Black Lives Matter protest. But he lives not far in the Chicago suburb, not far from us. It's an opportunity and a almost demanding that reporters should open an office in Kenosha <laughs> because that's how important it is and, and, and be doing a story on every detail. But our newspapers have been hammered down um, in their budgets. Uh, the Chicago Tribune has lost 400 reporters out of its newsroom. And this is, it's I mean, they were hammered down by Facebook and at all, which took yeah. the advertising revenue. And at the same time, you know, I mean, if, you look at, if you look at Kenosha, I mean, Facebook essentially operated as a recruiting office for getting people to go head over there with guns. So in every way, they, you know, degrade the, the level of discourse in our society, uh, which is why uh, anything that powerful and that venal should be regulated as quickly and strongly as anyone can figure out how. Uh, well, at this point in our conversation, uh, we're so lucky to be able to broaden our virtual circle and to be able to hear from a few other notable environmental pioneers and activists. Uh, we asked them if they would record their reflections and to pose a question to both of you as well. First, we will hear from Rushwood's 2018 honorees, Robert Redford and Sibylla Shigars Redford. Good evening and greetings to our Brushwood Center family. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight. In the midst of these uncertain times, Brushwood Center brings us hope for the future, and the focus of this symposium is both urgent and necessary. We must work together to create a new normal, one rooted in justice and sustainability. Bill and Sue, you've advocated for this future through every aspect of your lives. Thank you. We congratulate you, Bill and Sue, on receiving Brushwood Center's 2020 Environmental Leadership Award for your powerful work in advocating for this beautiful and vulnerable planet. Through your writing and activism, you have launched a call to action to preserve our shared home. Now your two voices have multiplied into a greater voice, a movement of hundreds of thousands of people around the world all advocating for change. 
Your message has touched our hearts and alerted our minds to the danger of inaction. The challenges we face today, the pandemic, the climate crisis, racial divisions, require deep systemic change. And this change is vital to the protection of our home, planet Earth, and should be a call that transcends all divisions. To do this, we need creative solutions that reignite people's deep connection to our planet and to each other. Advocacy, art, robust free press, experimental programs like Rushwood's, and grassroots movements like 350.org are powerful tools to accomplish the societal changes we so desperately need. And let us not forget the importance of voting. Securing a just and sustainable future for people and nature means taking a stand for what we believe in. We can all find ways to contribute to the movement that you have helped ignite. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown us as never before that all around the world we are in this together. While we each bring unique experiences and challenges, our future must unify us in action. We must not underestimate our collective power. And thank you for your leadership, Bill and Sue, and for harnessing this collective power for positive change. We congratulate you. And we leave with a question. From your perspective, what is the greatest obstacle that stands in the way of our society acting on climate change? I think that the biggest obstacle we face is remains the enormous power of the fossil fuel industry over our political system. And that's why it's been so important that people rose up, especially across the Midwest, to do things like challenge pipelines, get in the way of them, that people rose up to say, it's time for universities and churches and pension funds to divest from fossil fuel. And that work has been effective enough, I think, that that power balance is starting to shift and the ability of the fossil fuel industry to dominate our political life may be receding. If it recedes a little bit more, then there's actually a chance for reason to start prevailing. We don't lack for policies about how to deal with climate change we have lacked for the political will to implement those. And that's why this battle to diminish the power of this industry has been so crucial. Next, we'll hear from last year's honorees, Amory Levins and Judy Hill Levins. Hearty congratulations, Bill and Sue, on receiving Rushwood Center's Environmental Leadership Award. Bill, you're our nation's best leader and writer for climate protection. Sue, uh, your books are great, but your writings on, on keeping our right to vote may be even more vital right now. Uh, it's wonderful you're both in The New Yorker. Your writing and activism keep us all inspired, aware of the problems we face and the opportunities to fix them together in a spirit of applied hope. Thank you. We appreciated the hospitality and the terrific reception when we received the 2019 award and are sorry the pandemic is keeping you home during this celebration of the great leadership you both provide for the country and for the planet. We all miss being together at the beautiful Smith Nature Center venue, but at least we're all able to send the electrons and leave the heavy nuclei at home where they belong. Amory and I have made some serious changes this year and are excited about being able to work with focus and commitment to our goals and vision to build a more just, prosperous, verdant, and peaceful future. Here in the Banana Farm, I'm shortly going to start doing more university teaching and research to turn integrative design from rare to common and thus make the energy efficiency resource several fold bigger and yet cheaper. This will accelerate the clean energy revolution that's already gaining speed. World cold use peaked in 2013, world car sales in 2017, world fossil fueled electricity generation in 2018, 
uh, world CO2 emissions were flat in three of the past five years, but this year they're reversing their previous decade of growth. And this awful pandemic may well have made 2019 the global peak year for oil use and fossil fuel use in total, because by the time energy demand recovers to the extent it does, renewables will probably have become big enough to cover all future growth, contending fossil fuels to permanent decline. By June, the world's 16 biggest oil and gas companies put together were worth less than Apple. And now ExxonMobil has just exited the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Capital is fleeing fossil fuels, and that flight will <clears throat> reinforce their decline by shifting investment to efficiency and renewables, because they're cheaper, and by weakening fossil fuels uh, firms' talent and their political clout. It's not a moment too soon, and it will help defund some of the corruption, Sue, that you inspire us to unite against so we can all restore public integrity. My photographic work on my own and with Amory is expanding to bring nature's beauty into nonprofit workplaces in our community in Colorado and across the country. I'm excited about a local organization called Lead with Love, encouraging community and building action around issues like voting rights, vote by mail, and climate. We also became vegans this year and are losing weight, feeling better, and doing more good. Also, I'm loving being a wife, daughter of my healthy and independent 98-year-old mom, and as a mother of two, grandma two, friend, and homemaker, and hanging out in our passive solar banana farm with a 10-meter commute across the tropical jungle to our offices. I'm enjoying this chance to relax, rejuvenate, enjoy, and learn from people like you both. So let me ask, what would each of you encourage the other to do more or less or differently to help achieve the goals you both share? You go first. <laughs> uh, Sue is my role model. She's doing, as far as I can tell, she's doing everything right. And, uh, you know, what it's, you know, one of the, um, it's one of the secrets to our operation is that you know, we both get to support each other uh, pretty, pretty well. We live out here in the middle of nowhere, uh, you know, pretty much by ourselves now that our daughter's gone. And, and so it's awfully good to have her there. Oh, wow. I don't know if I can answer that question now. Um, all right, Bill. Um, you know, it's impossible because I live with a person who has been telling us about climate change and what to do about it for 30, more than 30 years. Um, I feel that I have uh, sort of absorbed his message in my pores, through my pores. And um, uh, I don't know what more he could do. I really don't. I mean, it's very frustrating. It's incredibly frustrating to have been with the person who told us about this so many decades ago and to see things deteriorate the way they are. Um, and I guess, you know, I end up feeling a little sad about it for Bill's sake, um, not just for the rest of us, but for Bill in particular, because it's so frustrating. Well, it's all here uh, in the many books that you have written. So, um, you know, the information for um, the questions and the answers, if people would just read it while well, we're ready to go march. I wish, I, wish it were, I wish it were just a matter of reading. <laughs> um, well, we're very lucky here in Illinois, by the way, uh, to have a true environmental warrior in Congress. Uh, he's Representative Sean Kasten, and he also has a question for you. Hello, Bill and Sue. Congressman Sean Kasten here from Illinois 6th District, um, recently appointed congressman, longtime clean energy nerd. Huge congratulations to you both on the, the, the 2020 Distinguished Service Award. Much deserved, Distinguished Environmental Leadership Award, I should say, much deserved to both of you. And 
you know, deserved specifically because you have done what I think is consistently so hard. What I, what I find and I tell my colleagues all the time is that there is, there is that which is scientifically necessary and there is that which is what we perceive to be politically possible. And so much of the conversation around, around climate never gets above that conversation of what's politically possible. And what you have both done so effectively is you have never taken your eye off the prize. You have always reminded us that this doesn't matter unless we do what's scientifically necessary. At the end of the day, our kids, our grandkids aren't going to judge us by whether or not we got a bipartisan vote on the floor. They're going to judge us by whether we got back to the 350 parts per million that you were saying was necessary about 50 parts ago. Um, so thanks for all that you've done. I was, I, you know, was asked to leave with a question, and I, I just give you this. It, it strikes me that in my, you know, 20 years of being involved in energy and environmental policy, whether as a scientist or entrepreneur, and now as a member of Congress, we've transitioned from voices in Congress saying this problem is too complicated to act quickly, to some voices that are now saying this problem is too urgent to get bogged down in complexity, and either of those conclusions is suicidal and would welcome your thoughts on how we make sure that we still maintain the complexity and the understanding of this problem and elevate the voices who understand the details whilst also saying we have to move quickly. We don't have the opportunity to get this wrong, um, but we also don't have the opportunity to wait. So your thoughts on how we can be both recognize this as both urgent and complex would be welcome. Thank you again. Congratulations again. Stay safe. So it obviously is a hugely complex problem because it implicates every part of our economy. Pretty much everything that happens in the course of a day contributes somehow to this uh, spew of carbon into the atmosphere. So the answers to it are extraordinarily complicated. But since we have to deal with it very fast, time is not our friend. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has said that unless we make fundamental transformations, which they define as cutting emissions in half by 2030, then our chances of meeting the Paris targets are essentially nil. Uh, given that we have to move fast, we have no choice but to simplify. The basic task right before us right now is to shut down coal, oil, and gas as fast as ever we can. And really the only way to do that is the very rapid build out of renewable energy, sun and wind, and the batteries that store that power when the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing. And the good news and the thing that makes that uh, completely possible, not easy, but completely possible, is simply how well the engineers have done their job. If we've been having this conversation 10 years ago, uh, sun and wind were still expensive and intermittent and difficult to use sources of power. They're now the cheapest, cleanest, best ways to produce energy on this planet. We're going to go there 75 years from now. The planet's going to run on sun and wind for all the reasons that everyone can think of. The problem is we have to do it fast, fast. If we wait 75 years, we'll run the planet on sun and wind, but it'll be a broken planet. So we don't want to do that. Next, we have questions from our future leaders, three inquisitive middle school students from the COOL Learning Experience a Waukegan-based partner of Brushwood Center, providing environmental, social, and cultural learning experiences. Hello, my name is Gopher Snake. I'm in eighth grade. I've been in Cool Learning Experience for four years. Here's my question. What and who inspired you to be an environmentalist? So, um, first of all, I actually was one of those people who was in the streets when I was probably in middle school in, uh, for the very first Earth Day. And um, on my backpack, I had an Earth Day sticker. It was actually decal. Um, and did some work in my town. One of my very first pieces that I ever wrote for my local newspaper was about a battle over wetlands um, in our town. Um, so that was, you know, at the very, very beginning. Um, but I would say that um, Bill McKibben uh, is my big inspiration. Um, I talk to him all the time and listen to him and have kind of absorbed a lot of his uh, enthusiasm and 
and messages and uh, despair, but um, but mostly just his energy um, in this space. When when Sue and I were first going out 35 years ago or so, she gave me a as a present a book by the Kentucky uh, your neighbor in Kentucky Wendell Berry, the farmer and novelist and essayist. And I, I was very young at the time, 25 or something. And that was that book had powerful effect on me and the way that I was thinking. Um, so I, I do think it's really important that young people around the world, including middle schoolers, are now you know at the very forefront of this movement. Uh, it's not just Greta Thunberg. There are Greta Thunbergs all over the planet. Um, 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 and it's really good that they're as literate about all these questions as they are. Uh, doing a little bit of reading like that can only help. My name is Pickle Fog. I am in seventh grade. I've been in some cool, cool summer experience for four years. For four years, my question is: Did you ever think of stop gi of giving giving up, telling people to stop climate change? Well, uh, of course, there's times when one gets uh, sad because the, you know when you're losing battles or things. But we win a fair number of those battles now. And the reason I don't despair uh, is mostly because this movement keeps growing and growing very fast. And now young people are at the heart of it. But when I do get a little sad, it's a reminder of why places like Brushwood are so important. Uh, Sue, what do, I, what do I do when I get a little despairing about things? Bill puts on his hiking boots and takes a walk in the woods, usually with the dog. Um, and just goes out and enjoys what's there for the taking. Um, and, uh, you know, that's the restorative power. Both of us find the natural world to be, you know, absolutely central to our, and in our part of the world, it's the forest. We're in the northern forest. You guys are in the northern plains with those beautiful prairies. Um, but it, 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 it's all the same, you know, that sense of being, um, small in something larger than yourself is restorative in lots of ways. My name is Barnabo. I'm in the eighth grade and I'm from Cool Learning Experience. And my question to both Bill McKibben and Sue Halpern is, how can young people help the environment and in the face of climate change? Young people are doing an amazing job. Um, young people are, uh, increasingly, you know, at the center of the organizing. It, we were about a year away now, it was just about this time last year that we had the largest single climate demonstrations in history and they were organized mostly by Fridays for the Future, the, the group that kind of sprung up once Greta Thunberg started her school strikes in Sweden. And it was young people all over the world uh, of all kinds who really were at the forefront. Now, Really young people like that can't vote, but as they get a little bit older, that's one of the key things. And Sue has been writing a lot in recent weeks about the efforts of young, uh, of people to, of young people to register other young people and make sure that they turn out. Yeah, so I mean, one of the things that's really interesting about that is that a lot of those young people who are doing the registrations of other young people came directly from the youth climate movement. And they saw that connection between having a, 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 an agenda that they wanted to see put forward and making sure that they had people in power, in legislative power to do something about it. And one of the things we saw that happened um, was that the Green New Deal was really um, a position paper that was, was generated by young people. So, you know, it's true that you can't vote until you're 18, but it is not true that that limits you in what you can do to put forward uh, positions that make a difference. And nag the hell out of your parents too, you know? Oh yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> Let's talk to our daughter about that. I can't think of a, a better way to wrap up and we allowed our youngest people, our, our future generation, to have the last questions, really. So Bill, you, Bill and I really want to thank you both for taking the time to be with us and to share 
your thoughts, your insights. You are ever inspiring to all of us. Well, Thank back at you. It's a real pleasure to get to be with another journalistic couple. Yes. And just to say thanks to you guys for your work over the years in your own careers, but also for your work with places like Brushwood uh, that are just, you know, I mean, that's where the future lies. So we'll all do what we can to leave behind some kind of useful legacy. And someday we hope to come and see it. I was going to say, come visit. Yeah, Absolutely. We'd love to do that. We're very grateful to you all for what you do. Absolutely. All right. We'd love to have you. Get better. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Take care, y'all. Now we're all in for an extraordinary treat. Multi-Grammy Award nominee violinist Philippe Quint and former Chicago of the Year in classical music Vladimir Kulinovic have come together for a musical tribute to nature. We know that nature is a constant source of renewal and reflection, perhaps no more than now during the COVID-19 pandemic. And as if to prove that point, as much as we can virtually, a piano was placed outside on the grounds of the Brushwood Center through the generosity of Kauai Pianos and Family Piano for this performance. Just imagine being a hiker at Ryerson Woods as Vladimir and Philippe present Meditation from the opera Thais by the French composer Jules Massadin.
Thank you to Vladimir and Philippe for that remarkable performance. Vladimir has joined Brushwood Center's team as Director of Music and Well-Being, leading efforts to enhance healing and connect to nature through the power of music. Definitely keep an eye out for future music events and programs from Brushwood under Vladimir's creative leadership. We're sure that uh, you found this program as inspiring tonight as we did and that you will want to donate to Brushwood Center's COVID-19 Response Fund. Now you do that by texting the word THRIVE to this number, 72572. Once again, THRIVE 72572. Tonight's program is going to be made available on Brushwood Center's YouTube channel. So please share it with your family and friends, and frankly, even the people you don't like. <laughs> and our final request, please vote this November or during early voting. Well, we simply want to say from our perch to yours, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you on behalf of the Brushwood Center team, and we hope that you have a wonderful evening. Do you have any further advice for us? Advice? Well, I actually I do. Some advice from what else? A tree. Go out on a limb. Remember your roots. And how about this one? Enjoy the view. And may the forest be with you. I'll drink to that. And me too. To all of you. <laughs> <laughs>